And that's had a bit of a rude shock when in August this year, one of our Sengkang residents shared with me her own travelling experience when requesting for FWAs. The gist of it is that she's a mother of two, with one of her children requiring special attention. When she asked if she could retain her current FWA to better care for her children, her boss quipped that her kids are not even dying. If they were, then the company can consider giving more flexibility. While I recognise that such bosses could be a minority and it may be line manager specific, may not be representative of the firm's approach to FWAs, I find such attitudes in the whole, if you are not in the office, how do I know that your working mindset very troubling? Through this adjournment motion, I wish to reiterate my call for the government to legislate the right to FWAs for all workers and go beyond guidelines, advisories and moral suasion. If we need another reason to legislate FWAs, we need to look no further than the other aspect of productivity, where our total fertility rate is now at a record low of 1.04 for 2022. If COVID-19 is described as a crisis of a generation, then our TFR issue is in my mind the crisis of many generations, given the steady and worrying decline in our TFR, which could spell an existential crisis for Singapore and Singaporeans. We may have enhanced the baby bonus scheme by a couple thousand dollars, raised unpaid infant care leave while increasing the number of voluntary paternity leave by two weeks, while ironically reducing the working mother's child relief and making no changes to maternity leave which was last changed 15 years ago in 2008. But I'm not sure these new measures fundamentally address the tension between one's career and one's parental responsibilities. I acknowledge the concerns that the government has around legislating for more leave. But we need to balance not just the short-term implications on the way companies have to redesign work processes, but the long-term implications on our nation should the issue persist. Take childcare leave, for example, which many MPs have also spoken about. It stands at six days a year, regardless of the number of children one has. Yet, based on ECDA's guidelines, preschools can have up to six days of annual closures and three half days on the eve of any of the five stipulated public holidays. A Sengkang resident of mine further shared that there are eight full days and one half day closure for the childcare centre that she sends her kids to. So, without even having our children fall sick, the existing childcare leave provisions are not even sufficient to deal with the scheduled school closures. And to this point, I'm sure many parents with young children will agree with me that they fall sick too often. And as much as parents want to be socially responsible, not everyone has the flexibility at work to look after their children when they fall sick. We cannot expect incremental efforts to result in extraordinary results. We need to take bold and decisive steps and provide greater financial and non-financial support to Singaporean families, recognising that the stresses on families and the TFR crisis of generations, if not urgently addressed today, would have significant long-term social economic costs to Singapore. Now, while we step up efforts to make flexible arrangements more accessible, we need to resist the simplistic tendency to think that all forms of flexible work arrangements can be implemented for every job. After all, every worker's and every team's needs differ, and the nature of work differs across sectors. Now let's take a broader view of flexible work arrangements. Apart from work from home, flexible work arrangements also include options such as staggered work hours, flexi shift, part-time work, and others. For flexible work arrangements to be sustainable, we also need to consider the impact on individual productivity and team productivity. More international literature on the business impact of flexible work arrangements have emerged recently, and they have found that the impact of flexible work arrangements on productivity differs across sectors and job roles. The key is to make sure that we identify the right forms of flexible work arrangements for different job needs and ensure that communication between management and employees and within teams remains strong. There is just no one-size-fits-all approach for this. Flexible work arrangements, if implemented well, can help companies retain and attract workers amidst a tight labour market. Turning flexible work arrangements into something rigid could be detrimental to businesses and even to workers themselves. We have seen that happen elsewhere, such as in Apple and Amazon in the US. We encourage employers to see how flexible work arrangements can benefit the businesses as a competitive advantage, facilitate employer-employee communication so that mutually beneficial arrangements can be found, and most importantly, maintain workplace trust. It is in this spirit that we are introducing the tripartite guidelines on flexible work arrangement requests in 2024, 
which will set norms and expectations on how employees can make requests for flexible work arrangements and use them responsibly, and how employers can manage requests for flexible work arrangements properly and fairly. The Tripartite Work Group will study international practices and consult widely with employers, HR practitioners and employees in the upcoming months as we formulate the guidelines. The work group will also develop recommendations on how to equip employers, HR, line managers and employees with the necessary skills to implement flexible work arrangements in an effective and sustainable manner. We believe this is the right approach to take and will help more workers assess flexible work arrangements that they require in a sustained manner. 